From time to time, we've gotten requests from people asking about uh, using white and various uh, various things that deal with things that are white. And we've done several, but not necessarily this one. This person asked, could you do the quick, a quick tip with a white animal on snow? I'm struggling with a white sheep on a field of white. Um, so, yeah, we'll do that. Well, like I always say in these, uh, it's not what it is, but it's what it is. In, I said not always say, but a lot of times. It's uh, what the light's doing to it. What kind of light is your white animal under and your snow? That determines, that's the first consideration. Now, let's look at what happens if that white animal on snow is in an overcast light, like this one is right here. It's the values, it's two things. One, it's the values and it's subtle variations of color. So that's what I want to show you. I want to show you both and give you just a little bit of guidance as how you can move yourself through that. Now, you can see in this, in this photograph, this is a fox and on snow, obviously in an in a overcast sky. Uh, and so, but what I want you to notice is you don't really see any white. You see, well, let's use the value scale to show you what you see. There's the value scale. Now you can see uh, there's white, and you see that's a darker color than white. Under an overcast sky, the white of snow, the white of anything, uh, is going to be a little bit darker. You can see it's closer to this value right here if you squint. It's going to be just a little bit darker, perhaps a degree darker, uh, under an overcast sky because the the, the, the clouds of the overcast are actually blocking the light rays. So you can't get the strongest light rays in an overcast situation. There's your first thing. The other thing I want you to notice is how uh, in the sky portion of that, it's actually a little bit lighter than it is in the various portions of the snow. Now if I put my value scale right here, you see in, that, in the snow that is on the ground or closer to us here, Look how dark we can see. We see those variations in value. Now we can see the value of that goes closer to this right here. So we have the value difference. Uh, actually, if I move that around, we can see in some places it's even darker. Uh, say right over here, it begins to fall more in this value area right there. So one of the first things that you pay attention to is, uh, according if it's under an overcast light, then how much does the value change between where, oh, that's not really in the sky, that's further back where the skylight is hitting it stronger. But even if you notice, if you see sky there, uh, oftentimes you will see that the areas of the sky will not be white, but they'll be about this value right here. Then the other thing is the same as you will observe in uh, a direct light, I'll show you in a moment. Look at the variations in value. That's what shows you what you do to create that bit, that image of the uh, whatever the white animal is in the snow. Now look here for example, you see how very dark that is? A lot of people just use white <laughs> because they think it's a white fox, although well, you see that doesn't cut it. You see areas of that are at least this dark and darker areas of that are at least that dark and perhaps a little darker. Do they not areas of that go Yes, look at that. There's an area here in the very uh, deeper part of the shadow area of the tail. You see that is this value right here. And that, on this value scale, is on the shadow side. So the value differences are what create the image. Your ability to find, the, find and create those value differences. Okay, now in direct light, we have something different. Now, if you go back to three, uh, quick tip 392, 
I did an experiment there where I showed you uh, the effects of direct light on images and the position of the sun. Here you can see the sun is relatively low because we see uh, this part, the whole part right here in shadow. And we see some light reflecting right here. So that tells us that the, the direct light is coming from about right over there at that angle. And you can see here the photograph translates that as really light. You see that? Now you can see some value difference in there. A very shallow dark just a little bit darker that shows us the difference between the bottom of his chin where the light rays are hitting and then as it goes under his neck where the light rays are not hitting quite so strongly. But then I want you to watch this. Notice how dark those shadows go in snow on a white animal. So we see the light here. Now as I move this, it's darker than that, darker than that, darker than that. It's about, well, areas, if you'll notice, it's, it's gradating from lighter to darker right here. Now that's the kind of observation uh, artists, painters must make, is how much is that value gradating. And you can see in the photo it shows a clear gradation from this dark, this value of dark, which is close to this one right here, to about this, well actually, yeah, a, Maybe about, depending on where it is, it, 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 it gradates gradually going from this dark down. And you see the same here and here. Also notice on the shadows of the snow, how very dark those shadows are. Squint, even a little darker than that. Squint, no, okay, a little lighter. It's right in this area right in here on those really dark areas of the snow. So um, I'll show you just a little bit of how you might do that because I also want to talk to you about what colors you use. Now you will not use, well you could if you want to, but it doesn't give you the full depth and expression of a white animal on snow. If you use black and white, uh, you don't get the same depth and the same um, interpretation, depth of interpretation as you will, it will if you'll use complementary colors. So for, for translating the light or transposing even, for interpreting the, the direct light on a white animal in snow or in a, in, on any very, very light surface, your best bet when something's really in the neutral range like that is to go with a set of complements. I'll show you that in a moment. Same thing is true for an overcast light. Black and white is only going to make you feel like a black and white picture. But if you go for a set of complements, now depending on the color of the light, sometimes you can go, you could actually go with a set of purple and yellow as your complements, and this and this will that will give you the range you need there. Uh, or you might just go around your color wheel and find a set of complements that will best when mixed together and become more neutral will give you this. Here, and this usually happens, we can see that uh, when the sun is shining, often the blue of the sky, the sun shining, there's blue in the sky. And that blue in the sky gets reflected in the shadows that we're seeing. And we'll see this range sometimes of this very uh, uh, low saturated blue, and sometimes it might, we might even see some purples reflected in it. But I've found that to interpret something like this, a really good uh, complementary set of colors is blue and orange. Uh, so I have on my palette here uh, this ultramarine blue and I have three values of it right here just to show you, I'm not going to do a complete painting of the fox, but I want to just give you, a, uh, give you a way to launch this and move forward with it, show you possibilities. This is um, a low saturation uh, a low intensity, or you might call it low chroma, of orange or red orange. This is the Rembrandt Transparent Oxide Red. Uh, Daniel Smith has a quinacridone orange that's very similar to that. But uh, starting out with a set like that is a good way to go. Now let me show you how. Uh, for this dark, for these darker values of the shadow in here, then if you mix 
bring the uh, going into the middle value of the transparent oxide red, such as I'm doing here, and then bring just enough blue into it to get it not quite completely neutral. And I'm going to show you the difference here. We we have this, we have that as uh, almost neutral. And in fact, that's leaning a little bit more towards the transparent oxide red. I put a little bit more blue into it. This is the ultramarine blue, as I said before. I, I prefer that for this sort of thing because it doesn't become yellow like the uh, thalo blue or ceruleans and those will. And let's look at the different seeds. And there we get that a uh, little bit bluer. And if we want a little bit bluer, we could pull just a little bit more into it. You see what I'm doing on the palette right here? And there it gets. Now here, this gets very close to what we have right here. And you can see that. When I compare it to the back of my brush, you can see there. So then we'll see variations of this. Let me show you. We'll see variations of it becoming, in some cases, a little bit bluer, like we have right here. Uh, a little bit bluer over here, and maybe a little less blue. Now when I say more blue and less blue, I'm talking about the saturation between uh, the, the ultramarine blue, or with mixtures of ultramarine blue, transparent oxide red, and white white to control the value. Uh, as it gets lighter, we can go up into the lighter portion. I've got the three values as I said before here. I like to do that in order to get, make it a little bit easier to control. And so if I go into more blue for the lighter, and I can even come this way and, and get that variation in value, then you see I get something kind of like that. And we can see this sort of thing appearing more in the tail. So you get that sort of variation right there in the tail. But notice right here we see a little bit of red, red orange. And that's what we have right here. So we go back and pick up a little bit of the red orange and just add it in and we get something like this, you see, which is very close to what we're seeing right here. We can make that lighter, go back into the lighter portion of red orange, just pull a little bit at a time, control the mixtures gradually and we see that's what we are seeing. We see that right in there and there. And we also see that in variations of value in the weeds that we see poking out of the snow. You can also use that uh, for, the. I think the fox has got his tongue sticking out there, doesn't he? That sort of thing. As you get into the lighter portions, I'm going to rinse the brush out now. As you get into the lighter portions, um, then you can go for the lighter side of those mixtures by starting out with just a very light version. Let's pull some white now. Not pure white, believe it or not. Pure white by itself. Here it is. Pure white by itself. It depends on the white. This is titanium white. Uh, and you can see uh, titanium white generally appears to be a little bit of a warmer white than zinc white. But zinc white seems to be a little bit cooler. Uh, but if you will just take a touch. Let me show you how to do this. If you go into something like this is cadmium yellow deep, which is a yellow orange. It's a high intensity, high saturation. It's a, it, is, it is totally saturated in hue. A little bit of that, tiny bit of that. We put a little bit of the white into that and mix them. And so that we get it almost white. Almost white. And then we add just a little bit of this. This has a little bit of orange in it. Add a little bit of this into it now that I want you to see what that the effect of this. Look, it's a little bit lighter. And a little bit more. I always think of this as the sunshine. This is mixing sunshine. And we can see right in here, we see that brightness of that. Now when we have that mixture next to the blue, let's just um let's see, let's let's do this. Let's do this right. I'm going in for a a, uh, another going in for about what we see. We'll see where we could find this. Just to, to, but what we see about right there, we see kind of a, a almost a transition. I think of it as transition value grew that blue. That's the blue that appears between where the light hits and then where it goes into shadow about right in there. And that tends to be a little more neutral in this case. So I'll make that a little bit more neutral and. Mix that very carefully. You see, when you you're doing these uh, when you're doing these mixtures for neutrals, you you don't just grab a bunch of it and mix them uh, uh, willy nilly. 
but you control the mixture by gradually pulling one color into another. So I want that to be more cool. And let's put it, let's put it about right here. That's probably that's a, needs to be a little bit cooler. A little bit cooler means a little more blue. Cool always means more blue, uh, whether it's a color that has blue in it or if it's blue itself. That's more like it right there. So that's pretty close. And now let's get enough of that down so that you can see. Now I'm going to rinse the brush, which is very important when you're working areas like this. Rinse the brush, and let's let's use that sunshine mixture and show you how they will emphasize each other so that this let's get a little bit lighter. A little bit lighter. This needs to be barely tinted. That white does not not really yellow or not really orange, just barely tinted. That look if I put that right here, see how see how nice and bright that appears? And then if I blend them together, such as we see right here, just do a slight blend them up together. You see how then that blue just emphasizes that light. If I put more of that blue on the other side, such as we see right here, you'll see it more emphasized. And you see this, because this shadow is here, dark and cool, against this. They're, 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 they're located side by side. Uh, then th this emphasizes this. You see, we don't feel it quite so emph emphasized there. But you see, if I reach in for this middle value, see, that's about the same value as that. And I'm going to get it just a little bit desaturated. Desaturate just a little bit with that red orange. And let's get plenty of it. See, it's, yeah, that's pretty right. That's <laughs> about right right there. Now, if I put it right here, watch how it emphasizes that white. That blue just brings out that orange that's in the white. And let's get that, just, I'll just blend up my finger a little bit right there. There you go, right there. Now you can see how this then emphasizes that. So that's, this emphasizes that, and so does this. This is more neutral more and cooler, where this is warmer and, and a little more saturated and much lighter. And you can see that these emphasize. So that's what you watch for when you're doing any white on white. Or whether it's a white animal on snow, it doesn't make any difference. Any white on white, you watch for two things. You watch for the, first of all, where's the light source? What's it doing? The direction of the light source, where it's hitting the strongest. And then cr controlling the color, controlling the temperature. Using compliments, you can always do that. So with compliments, you already have, you always have a warm and a cool. And so you can control with the value, the degree of value of contrast, how dark it is against how light, like we have right here, like we have right there. Or if it's, if it's the light gradating is the word we use there, or blending, same thing. The light blending into the dark where it gradually gets darker. Both those things add to that brilliance of the white. And using those principles, you should be able to do any white animal on any on snow or any other white surface. So you see the real how-to here is not how to paint a number of images that you select from different places and put into one made-up painting. It's how to recognize where that light source is and how that light source is, is affecting all of your images. What's it doing to the color? What's it doing to the value? What's it doing to the degrees of values in the light, in the degrees of values in the form shadows, and in the cast shadows? If you do that, you can do a painting that's made up out of your head of one image, a dozen, or even hundreds. Be sure to view all of our quick tips. While you're doing so, subscribe to the channel, click on the bell, so you'll always get a notice when we produce a new quick tip, which is every week. And if you have a question, leave it in the comments section and we'll make a quick tip for you. Also, take a trip over to DianeMize.com where I have full length lessons, downloads, DVDs, lots of other stuff there, some free stuff for you. And while you're there, you can subscribe to the newsletter and that way you'll always be informed every time we do something new.